Hello and welcome to a collaborative industry webinar series focusing on tomato potato psyllid with a short update on fall armyworm and vegetable leaf miner. This series contains five separate 15 minute presentations delivered by industry specialists aimed at informing and upskilling producers and service industry providers on key research and topics associated with these pests. These pests can cause significant economic damage to a large range of horticultural crops and their management is essential in assuring sustainability of the industry. Please feel free to send through any questions that you may have to the email address supplied at the end of each presentation. Please sit back, relax and enjoy the presentations. Melinda Moyer is an entomologist from the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. Her presentation will focus on the following topics associated with tomato potato psyllid. Morphology, the Horticultural Innovation National Monitoring Project, and the mass testing for CL at CLSO in WA. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, as Annie said, um, I'm going to be focusing on three aspects of TPP today. Um, the morphology, the National Surveillance Project and the Mass CLSO testing in Western Australia. So let's move on to the morphology of TPP. I'm going to call it TPP, um, short for tomato potato psyllid. So as Callum just mentioned, the life cycle of, the, of TPP is quite simple. We start off with very small eggs. These hatch into nymphs. Uh, that's the juvenile form of the psyllid. There are five instars and they gradually get bigger as they move through these instars. These instars are very sessile. They uh, stick to the plant, they can't fly. Um, you can see the wing buds in the later instars. When they move between instars, they shed their skin. So we've got all these little white, uh, they look like scales, but they're, they're exuvia, they're the skin of the, of the nymphs until finally we get to the adult stage. The adult stage has wings, so they fly around to the different plants. So we use, uh, as Callum said, sticky traps in our surveillance for TPP and it catches the adults. This sticky trap on the left-hand side is covered in uh, TPP. It's very hard though to tell the TPP apart from other insects particularly aphids and other psyllids. On the right hand side, we have a series of adult photos uh, from our typical dark chocolate brown one on the top with the white stripes through to a yellow adult at the bottom. Um, so the color, the idea of this slide is to show you that the color uh, can change quite a lot. So color is not a good indication of whether or not you have TPP because in Australia, where we have one of the most speciose psyllid faunas in the world, we have a lot of different species. And on uh, solanaceous plants, particularly native plants in Australia, we've already found three native species of psyllid that occur on those plants and can complete their life cycle. For example, uh, here's a little Achisia species that's found on a native solanaceous plant. Uh, just by having a quick look at the photo, you can see it, it does look quite different from any of the three different colour morphs of the uh, TPP. But as I said, colour is not a good indication of being able to tell them apart. So how do we tell these little critters apart when they're on these sticky traps from everything else? Well, here we have a typical TPP individual. The first thing that we look at is their wings. We look at the wing venation, so they're the lines on the wing. Most psyllids in Australia belong to the family psyllidae. They have a bifurcating vein that separates here into two veins, whereas TPP belongs to the family Troezidae. And now the main feature of Troezidae is that the vein separates into three different veins. So it's a trifurcating split. So this is quite easy to see, even with the naked eye, um, we can see this split. So that's our first indicator that we may have a TPP. The second really good indicator is this bottom RS, sorry, this bottom RS vein along the bottom of the wing. 
in TPP, it's a really long vein and it's quite wavy. It almost reaches to the end of the wing. Many other triosids, it, it, it's not that long and it's certainly not wavy like that. We have another species that we've been finding in Perth that looks remarkably similar to TPP. The main difference is this uh, wing vein, the RS wing vein, in which it finishes about where that red arrow is. So it comes down to the end of the wing, about where the red arrow is, and that means that the cell that it cuts off looks a bit like a triangle. TPP, the cell that the RS vein creates, doesn't look like a triangle at all. So that's our main indicator. Another indicator, if you have a look at the antennae, even when the, the triosid itself is yellow, the TPP is yellow, the antennae is still, still has this black and white banding. Another feature of the antenna, which really you need a microscope to see, but it has a little lump on the fourth antennal segment. That's a little pore called a rhinarium and it's covered, it's got a little covering and that makes the lump. And finally, if we're still unsure about whether we have a TPP, we have to have a look at the male genitalia, which is in this little capsule at the end of the abdomen. It looks like a little segment that's kicked up. Um, and within that, if you open it up, the male gen genitalia sits in there. And to tell all different species of psyllid and troezid apart, you need to have a look at that male genitalia. We know that this specimen's a male because it's got that genital capsule kicked up. If it was a female, it would look more like a parrot's beak, so it'd be pointed downwards. Now on to the National TPP Surveillance Project. The aims of this project were to, uh, for, was for early detection of TPP in Australia in areas that we currently don't have TPP. It's also to give confidence in Australia's freedom from CLSO and it's not meant to replace existing TPP surveillance but instead complement it in each state and territory. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. Western Australia is leading this project and we have collaborating um, state governments in Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, Queensland and Northern Territory. The responsibilities of those uh, different states and territories is that they recruit the adopter trappers, so the people who put out the sticky traps. They do their own identifications on everything on the traps. If they find TPP, um, then it's up to them to test it for CLSO, and they liaise with industry within their states and territories. Now, DPIRT in Western Australia backs them up. So if they want secondary identifications and testing done, then we're quite willing to help them out. Now, as I said, we're complementing um, TPP surveillance. So as was the case in Western Australia, when we found TPP, it came in through the metropolitan area. So we expect that if it's going to arrive in the other states and territories, it's most likely to turn up in gardens within their capital cities. So this project focuses on the urban and peri-urban areas of the capital cities in the different states and territories, except WA of course, because we've already got surveillance occurring in Perth. So here in WA, um, we were looking at the regional centres that um, are important for horticulture. Most of the project is funded by HIA, Hort Innovation Australia, uh, but all the different states and territories have kicked in in-kind expenses. The project runs for three years. So we began in, all, in August of 2019. Um, and this map shows the centres in which we've got trapping. Uh, in the purple square are the numbers of traps that we aim to put out every year. So in most capital cities, we have 600 traps that we're trying to get out. In the Northern Territory, we've got a few more, 820. In the regional centres in Western Australia, we're focusing on Kununurra, Carnarvon, Geraldton and Albany. We were trying to get 250 traps out per year in those areas. Now we have already gone through one um, full sampling season. That was in spring of 2019. 
it's important to realise that we're following the growing seasons in each area. So, for example, we were too late last year to trap in Darwin. We missed their growing season. So we have to make up for that in the coming years. Um, they're going to begin shortly, actually, in Darwin for 2020. The other states managed to get their traps out, and uh, as did Western Australia, we got 100 traps out in each of the regional centres. The other states uh, got some, did uh, more than others in their regional centres. That means their autumn trapping didn't have to be as, as large. So what have we found so far? Well, in Western Australia, as I said, we had 100 traps per region. That basically equates to 25 adopter trappers because each trapper put out a trap for a, um, one trap per week for four weeks. So each trapper returned four traps. In Western Australia from last year, from spring, we found no TPP in Kununurra. That was a good thing. In Carnarvon, unfortunately, we found one male TPP. In Geraldton, we actually had 407 TPP from eight sites. So eight homes out of the 25 that we trapped at. In Albany, there were 21 TPP from four out of the 25 sites. So basically using this national project and also other deep herd surveillance, such as my pest guide reports, we've worked out that TPP occurs all the way from Esperance in the south up to Carnarvon. So what's happening with the project now? Well, unfortunately, COVID-19 stepped in and delayed our autumn 2020 um, surveillance for New South Wales, Queensland and WA. The other states managed to get their traps out in time, but um, we didn't. Um, but in the meantime, we've excluded Albany, Carnarvon and Geraldton from the national project because we've now found TPP at those sites and it was unrealistic to try eradicating TPP from those areas. So instead we've redirected the funds into CLSO surveillance in the metro region because just as TPP arrived in Perth first in the state, we think that if CLSO is to arrive in um, Australia, it's most likely to arrive through the metro areas. So we're, um, we're doing more surveillance there. Um, and we've planned for Kununurra surveillance to begin at the end of June, uh, start of July for this year. If we move on to the mass CLSO testing in Western Australia, the aim of this testing, again, is to give confidence in Australia's freedom of CLSO and is to provide uh, an indicator that if CLSO has arrived in Australia to try and give us some early detection so we've got a chance of eradicating it before it spreads. So here's a picture of an adopter trapper. Here's that same trap that I showed before, the sticky trap that was covered in TPP. How do we go about testing our traps for CLSO? Well, the adopter trapper will send in their sticky trap. Our entomologists take it uh, into the lab with the associated paperwork. We count all the TPP that are on those traps and mark them like this. So we write down the abundance per trap of TPP. Then we cut out the TPP off those sticky traps, put them into tubes, mash them up. They get sent into, put into extractor machines. Because the CLSO lodges within the salivary glands of the insect, We've got to try and extract it out of there before we can um, before we can test it to see if it is actually CLSO. From the extractor machines, it gets put into a PCR machine, which detects the molecular markers of the CLSO. We have a target of 1,690 TPP to test annually to show that we don't have CLSO within Australia. So we always exceed that. For example, in October 2018 to March 2019, we tested over two and a half thousand TPP. 
And not only do we have an annual quota for how many TPP we've got to test, but we also have a um, spatial quota. So in other words, we need to test 100 in TPP per local government area. Um, local government areas, we, here's a map of Perth on the right hand side and showing the local government areas that we need to select, we need to get 130 TPP from. And we can't take 130 TPP off one particular trap like that sticky trap we had before, which was covered we take a maximum of 20 TPP per sticky trap so that we try and spread the TPP out between different households. And so far from all this testing that we've done, we haven't detected CLSO in uh, Perth or Western Australia. And I forgot to mention before that we haven't had TPP detected in any other state or territory so far. Thank you.